So we spoke about it on the last show. Um, Kobe Bryant and his daughter and uh, seven other passengers died in a helicopter crash uh, in L.A. And, you know, it, it. what do you even say about it? I did my best to, um, you know, do justice to what happened and talk about um, how much I like Kobe and what he meant to me and many of his fans and how terrible I feel about it and everything. But again, I don't think in a situation like this, words really do justice. You find out at a time like this how inadequate words are to really describe a feeling. Because the feeling is so powerful that there's nothing that captures it. Um, well, Shaq, of course, is a you know former teammate of Kobe Bryant. Um, they've had their ups and downs, but he said repeatedly, this is like my, my little brother. That's who he is. I treat him like my little brother. I was his big brother. Yes, we had our ups and downs, but, you know, there was a an underlying love and respect that was just immovable. So he, NBA on TNT, which is, in my opinion, the best show on television, and it's not even close, um, they had an hour tribute show to Kobe the other day. There was supposed to be a Lakers game, um, and they canceled the Lakers game or suspended the Lakers game. They pushed it off to another date, but... They took that time and they did an hour-long tribute to Kobe. And I'm going to show you Shaq's um, emotional words here. And I think what he's saying is actually really important, given the circumstances and given how much this is impacting him and how much this is impacting a lot of people. And I will say, before I play the clip, let me say this. I'm a Knicks fan for life. Everybody knows that if they know me and they've watched the show or Kyle and Corrin. Um, but what I will say is, obviously, the Knicks are... Bad like they're bad almost every year. Obviously, they're even like out of the playoff running at this point. Just pathetic. But this season, go Lakers. Because LeBron James also said, you know, some very emotional comment, very emotional statement on it. And uh, he basically said, like, I want to do your legacy justice. And who doesn't want to see the Lakers now win the chip this season? And before, I was 50-50 between... I mean, obviously, again, my Knicks were out of it. I know that. I'm not stupid. So, it's like, okay, who do I want to see win? I was like 50-50 between the Bucks and the Lakers. Now, I'm 100% Lakers. I want to see the Lakers win the championship. I want to see them do it for Kobe. Um, it, it would just be fitting. It would just be fitting. But who's not a Lakers fan now this season? Like, you have to be. If you don't... What, do you not have a heart? <laughs> so, anyway... Go Lakers, but here's Shaq's emotional tribute to Kobe, and there's a very important message in here. Sharif called me devastated and said, Kobe, just text me to check and see how he's doing. And he used to do that from, from time to time. You know, it just makes me think that in, in life, sometimes instead of holding back certain things, we should just do We, uh, we up here, we work a lot. And I think a lot of times we, we, we take stuff for granted. Like, I don't talk to you guys as much as I, as much as I need to. The fact that uh, we're not going to be able to joke at his Hall of Fame ceremony. We're not going to be able to say, hi, I got five, you got four. The fact that we're not going to be able to say, if we would stay together, we could have got 10. Those are the things that you, you can't get back. And with the loss of my father, my sister, and my thing, that's the only thing I wish I could just say something to him again. Last time I talked to him was when we were here and I asked him to get 50 and he got 60. The last time I spoke to him. And I just wish I could have, you know, so. It, it definitely changes me. I have to, because I work a lot. You, you, you guys know what I do. I, I, I work probably more than the average guy, but I just really have to now just take time and just call and say, I love you. Rick Fox call, finally called me and said, man, I love you. B. Shaw called me. So I'm going to try to do a better job of just reaching out and just talking to the people rather than always procrastinating, because you never know. Life was too short. I never, I could never imagine nothing like this. I was thinking the other day, I've, I've never seen anything like this. 
All the basketball idols that I grew up, I see them. They're old. Like I used to be at home when you came to interview me, Ernie. I used to watch the great round, round, round of rebound. Now I'm working with him. I used to want to be Dr. J. He used to live next door to my mother in Orlando. My father used to tell me about the three great big men. I met them. I seen them. And the fact that I, we lost probably the world's greatest Laker, world's greatest basketball player, it's just, I, listen, people are going to say, take your time and get better, but it's going to be hard for me. I already don't sleep anyway, so, but I'll, uh, I'll figure it out. My condolence goes out to his family, his mom, his dad, his sisters, the other families, everybody involved. Laker organization, I talked to Jeannie and Linda, and uh, people here are hurting, especially in this organization. You know, some people have to get treatment, and some people just, just don't understand, because it hit all of us out of nowhere. I didn't want to believe it. I said to myself, Please, I, I hope somebody, some butt face made this up, and it's not true. I didn't want to believe it. And then after getting all the, com the, the calls, and then you finally feel it was concerned, it just, it just, you know, my spirit just uh, left my body. I just wish I could be able to say one thing to the, one last thing to the people that we, we lost. Because, uh, you know, once you're gone, you're gone forever. And, you know, we should never take stuff like that uh, for granted. Yeah, so, I mean, the message is you can't take life for granted. Everything is really fragile. Everything can change in a second. And um, you have to tell the people that you love that you love them and cherish every moment. And as humans, you know, we oftentimes just default to existing. And, you know, homeostasis. It's like, yeah, I'm just, I'm not up here. I'm not down here. I'm just kind of coasting in the middle. It is what it is. And everything could seem dull and repetitive. But, you know, you start looking at things a little bit differently when you realize, oh, so there's no guarantees here. Like, if we're not all going to live to be 90 years old in our rocking chair with wrinkles and gray hair. It's not going to happen. And um, it's a stark reminder of that. And when you see something like that happen, it's like a wake-up call. And everybody's like, oh my goodness. Whoa. This is all real. We should try to cherish every second and definitely tell your friends and your loved ones and your family that you love them. Because you never know. So you almost want to make it so that like every interaction you have with people that you're close to make it like, would I be okay with it if it was my last interaction? And if you treat it like that, I'm sure it helps put people more at peace and at ease knowing that, you know, their message of love and affection is definitely broadcast out there to the people that they love. Um, but yeah, man, there's no... There's no guarantees in this world. I was telling you guys, th this one stung really bad because Kobe was always like superhuman to me. I'm um, the exact age to experience like all his whole career arc and all of his greatness. I'm a little too young for Michaels. I, re I remember maybe one year of Michael Jordan. Uh, Kobe, I remember all of it. I remember all of it. I remember watching like the early 2000s finals. I remember all of it. And uh, he seemed invincible. Um, the other thing that I'll mention real quick is I listen to, you know, somebody who's an expert on this kind of stuff talk about the accident. And, um, early on there were a bunch of theories out there as to, you know, how this could have happened. Um, weather is one theory, mechanical failure is another theory, namely because, uh, there was somebody who not an eyewitness because he couldn't see because of the fog, but he heard it and he said the helicopter sputtered out and then you heard a big boom. Um, so mechanical fa failure is an option and bad weather is an option. Um, but the person, the expert who I heard talk about this said that um, 
when you're dealing with a situation like they were in, where there's like extreme fog, it is super easy to get disoriented. And you literally could get to the point where you don't know what's down and what's up and what's left and what's right. Because if you can't see the horizon, your inner ear, it's all out of whack. So, um, it's possible he just got disoriented. And, uh, you know, what he thought was going up was going down. That's very possible. And the expert who I heard talk about this said, um, basically, it should be a law that you have a pilot and a co-pilot. Because there's a lot going on when you're flying. In planes, you have a pilot and a co-pilot. In helicopters, you don't have to have a co-pilot. But there's a lot of stuff going on. And that extra voice absolutely can be life-saving. The other thing is there's no black boxes. There's no law to have black boxes in helicopters. I don't know why. I don't know why that's not a law. Put a black box in a helicopter. Put a co-pilot in a helicopter. Yes, it'll increase costs for the various companies, but planes have them. You know, uh, what, it'll cost Kobe another 100 grand a year, 140 grand a year. I think he could swing that. <laughs> I think anybody who would fly in a private helicopter can afford to also have the co-pilot. So uh, that was one of the things that was recommended. Again, it is still possible that it was mechanical failure. Um, but what this expert was saying is they were told by air traffic control that they couldn't follow the highway that they were following anymore because there was a, a go around happening with an airplane. So in other words, at, at an airport, uh, which was the airspace they were going to have to fly through, a plane tried to land, couldn't land. So I had to go back up and around and try to land again. So they didn't have clearance to follow the same highway they were following. They were told to go to a different highway. So they went to go move to that different highway, but the fog got worse and they, um, they overshot the road that they were then supposed to follow. They overshot it. Um, and right before the crash, he pulled up big time and then went down. Now, either there, when he went up, presumably to try to get above the fog and to also find the, cause apparently with this kind of fog, you could see, you can't see it when you're looking straight and you're in it, but when you're above it, you could see down through it. I know it's really weird, but apparently this is what this aviation expert was saying about this particular kind of fog that they have in this area of California. So he was apparently trying to get up, up so he could look down and see the road. And either when he pulled up, there was some sort of mechanical failure and they just plummeted to the ground. Or because the fog was so dense and visibility was zero, he didn't even realize that he had, he was basically going into the ground. I mean, I know that sound to me when I'm hearing that, I'm a layman. I hear that. And I'm like, are you, you know, when you're going down, that's what I was thinking. But according to this aviation expert, if you have zero visibility, you at a, after a while, you don't know that left is left, right is right, up is up, and down is down. So he could have theoretically crashed right into the mountain thinking he was moving left or thinking he was going up. Oh, man, it just, it's, so, it's so terrible. All of it's so terrible. Um, anyway, rest in peace, Kobe and Jana and the seven others who were killed. And... Um, you know, that was very touching from Shaq, and it hurts to see another person in so much pain. 